All right, so let's, uh, let's start. Um, the first talk today is uh, building a multi-cluster privately hosted LLM serving platform on Kubernetes. Our speakers are, are um, Noah Yoshide and Julian Bright from Predibase. So uh, thanks a lot. Let's welcome them. Thank, thank you, everyone, and apologies for the, the slow start. Um, it's not because I'm from Australia, it's just generally a technical issue. But uh, yes, I have arrived uh, just yesterday actually from Australia and it's great to be here. Um, Chicago is a fantastic city. I hope you all have a great time over the, the course of the next few days. So we're talking about privately hosted LLMs on Kubernetes. Um, we're from Predibase. Uh, so I'm a platform engineering uh, manager in Predibase. So we've both been with the company pretty much since the early days. Um, we're a startup about two years into our journey, and we're really excited about uh, large language models, and we've built our platform on Kubernetes. So we'll be talking a little bit more um, today, and Noah will be diving deep on some of those technical um, challenges and, and sort of ways we've uh, approached solving some of these. So briefly, I was a bit surprised to see LLMs so small on the, on the sort of topic slide there, because you know that's all we think and talk about these days. But for those who aren't familiar with LLMs, they stand for large language models. So these started you know, back in you know, the early days of 2012 when the first generative pre-trained transformer model or GPT came out. But since then, you know, there's been a sort of real progression in the last couple of years in particular with GPT-3 from OpenAI leading to ChatGPT, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Um, and that really powerful, very large 175 billion parameter model has made it possible to do some incredible things. Um, so these, these models are trained on vast amounts of data, but they're also very flexible and very um, you know, intelligent in terms of what they can do out of the box with what's called like a zero-shot mode. So effectively, you provide an input, a prompt, and you know, it can do things like sentiment analysis, uh, transcription, many other um, sort of uh, text completion tasks, obviously writing prose and, and other pieces of content. Um, but they're also use, useful in enterprise contexts, which is where most of our customers are interested, and in fact, you know, using an open source model and being able to fine tune and present those, um, you know, sort of serving inference um, insights back to their business is a really uh, critical capability. So what you can see on this slide here is that, you know, since those large language models have appeared, we've had a lot of open source investment, particularly um, models like Meta's Llama and Llama 2, which are available in, in sort of smaller sizes of seven, 13 and 70 billion parameter, but still very powerful. And when you fine tune these models, what you find is you can get amazing results. So very quickly, in terms of what we do at Predibase, we've got a platform that allows you to connect your enterprise data into the platform and then build and train and deploy these models, these large language models. And we do that at scale in your own native cloud, as well as our managed SaaS platform. So in terms of some of the challenges um, you know, required to sort of meet these expectations of delivering inference, I won't go into them in too much detail, but the tools are complex, right? So you're, you're dealing with often you know, low-level Python programs typically. Um, when you're talking about fine-tuning these models, it's very easy to run out of memory, um, you know, particularly when you've got you know, very large models in the order of 13 billion or more. You can often hit these um, out-of-memory exceptions, and so making sure you do that efficiently can save you a lot of time and cost. And then in terms of serving, even the smaller models, they do require GPU compute. So, you know, NVIDIA T10 or, or, A, or A10 or A100s um, are typically required. So in terms of what we uh, look to do with Predibase is we make this easy. So we're, we're providing an open platform for this where you can bring, um, you know, your expertise of your engineering and developer staff and basically just get started through our API and SDK. Um, and in terms of the efficient fine tuning, we, we're built on an open source library called Ludwig.ai, um, and, and that has a lot of flexible capabilities to allow training with things like LoRa weights, which Noel will talk about a little bit later in the presentation. And finally, in terms of the serving piece, um, we make it very easy to make this cost effective by having just in time um, a, a sort of serving infrastructure provisioning and also scaling up these and using some of our own technology that we've developed called LoRax. Again, uh, Noah will touch on this. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Noah to continue uh, with some more technical details. Thank you. Cool. Uh, thank you, Julian. Uh, so one thing Julian didn't mention is at Predibase, we pretty much only have about you know, 
everyone came into Predibase with almost no Kubernetes experience. So, uh, you know, this has been quite a journey for us. Um, and I think it really speaks to the power of open source and, you know, Kubernetes and cloud native technologies that, you know, we're able to do all this uh, with like a pretty small team. Yep, so uh, from now on, I'm gonna be talking about specifically the LLM serving portion of Predibase, uh, some of the challenges that we've encountered while building it out um, and how we've kind of navigated those. So there, when, once we started building this platform, there were about three kind of like big challenges that we faced. Uh, the first was GPU availability and then GPU cost and finally privacy. Um, so despite uh, there being many breakthroughs in fine tuning and serving technology uh, for you know, serving and fine tuning on commodity hardware, uh, there's still a lot of limitations around what you can do unless you, know, you have a lot of GPU memory. So currently the standard for you know, doing all this uh, work with large language models is the NVIDIA A100, uh, which is quite difficult to find at the moment if you've ever tried to acquire them in AWS or Azure. Um, and even if you do uh, manage to get them, they can be quite expensive. Um, finally, a lot of customers uh, that you know, we've talked to care a lot about uh, having their models and training data remain in their control. So they're not comfortable sending off all this like proprietary data and they're like very important models off you know, to be trained in someone else's cloud. They really want that to all remain kind of in their private VPC and their account. Um, so building around these challenges and kind of overcoming them was our main goal uh, at Predibase when building our uh, LLM serving platform. So the pretty big serving stack can be broken, broken down into several distinct layers, uh, the first of which is our multi-cluster service mesh, which I'll talk about. So why multi-cluster, first of all? Uh, so the first reason, as I alluded to earlier, um, is that customers care about uh, privacy. So building a pretty base with a multi-cluster service mesh has allowed us to uh, deploy you know, data plane comp uh, components where the serving and uh, fine tuning happens into the customer VPC so that they remain in control of their data. It's also allowed us uh, to deploy into environments uh, where we can find cheap and available uh, GPUs, such as uh, dedicated GPU clouds or on-prem providers. And then finally, uh, using a service mesh, this is a little, like, I won't talk about this too much, but it has allowed us to scale up our platform uh, a lot more because now we don't have to you know, deploy the control plane and data plane at the same time. We can kind of deploy independent data planes for each customer all managed by a single control plane. So here's a kind of high level view of the Predibase architecture. So it consists of multiple Kubernetes clusters all you know, registered into the same Istio service mesh. So each data plane uh, for a customer, if they choose to deploy like this, uh, lives in their VPC and their cloud account. Um, and all of these uh, cloud accounts as well have a blob storage provision, so that's where like uh, model artifacts will go. And that has allowed us to kind of alleviate some of the concerns with uh, data governance. Also, uh, if customers are okay with uh, us hosting their compute, um, they can register to the Predibase kind of AI cloud platform. So what this is is compute managed by us, uh, where we have multiple Kubernetes clusters spread out between both the public cloud and uh, dedicated on-prem like GPU clouds. So when customers are able to queue, when they queue up jobs uh, for fine tuning or serving, we can reroute the job uh, based on some heuristics to either the uh, you know the public cloud or the on-prem cloud based on you know if they need A100s essentially. Um, and using Istio and kind of this like multi-cluster deployment has allowed us to really alleviate both the uh, GPU availability and the cost restriction, as well as the kind of privacy concerns. And going a bit more into that privacy part, um, if for those maybe familiar with Istio, this uh, might be a little bit familiar, but for those who aren't, um, with Istio, you are allowed to configure um, authorization policies. And what we have is a kind of centrally managed uh, Istio control plane that allows us to um, you know, manage all of this locally, not in the customer data planes, so that we can restrict communication between customer deployments. So next, going you know, a bit deeper, is uh, serverless inference. So first of all, why would we want serverless inference at Predibase? So the two main reasons, as you could probably guess, are cost and traffic. So as I mentioned earlier, GPUs are quite expensive. Even if you can find them, you know, A100s aren't cheap. So we really don't want to be running models that aren't serving traffic. 
So this is both for us and for the customers, because if they are deploying the data plane into their account, they're going to be paying for all the compute. Uh, finally, we also do want to be able to scale up traffic, uh, scale up the models as traffic increases, because uh, you know LLM models can be quite bursty with like, people, you know, wanting to do a bunch of experimentation at one time and then kind of you know forgetting, forgetting about it and kind of turning it off after a while. So this is kind of a, a little bit more of a detailed look at a priority based control plane and data plane. Um, so this will kind of help us understand a bit more about how we first uh, developed LLM serving at PrediBase. So remember, of course, there are multiple data planes, but here's just pictured one. Um, and I'll kind of go a bit into how we initially created LLM serving. So first, uh, when customers would want to provision an LLM, uh, the request would come in through our SDO ingress gateway in the control plane. Uh, it would just kind of go through our API gateway uh, for authentication and then go to our workflow orchestrator where we would kick off an uh, asynchronous workflow which gets picked up by the PrediBase agent which lives in the data plane. So side note, this is all kind of application level workflow management. Uh, this isn't using any kind of Kubernetes stuff in case you're wondering. Um, but the reason why we do this is we want to have um, you know, some work executed on the data plane where we want to talk to the Kubernetes API server. So generally we weren't comfortable giving API server access kind of out universally to all these data planes, so instead the PrediBase agent uh, kind of takes care of creating deployments and whatnot on the cluster. So once the PrediBase agent gets the, uh, the request to provision an LLM, it will uh, create the deployment and then the weights for that model will be downloaded from that data planes uh, model store. So this, is, this uh, blob storage is also in the, that, that customer's account or that VPC's account. And then finally, during LLM inference, uh, the request will come in through the gateway, which will get authenticated and routed to the LLM in the data plane via an, an Istio virtual service. So this is you know, all well and good, but let's actually look at what, you know, what we have to do to make this uh, serverless. Because right now, this, you know, this is pretty bare bones, doesn't auto scale or do any of that. So what we did to kind of introduce auto-scaling uh, and serverless into this LM serving was using KEDA. So KEDA stands for the Kubernetes event-driven uh, auto-scaler. So it's a project that allows you to scale Kubernetes deployments based on a variety of metrics or events in the cluster. So in our case, we are using the HTTP plugin. So this allows us to scale up and down the deployment based on the number of incoming requests uh, although we are looking at like you know a variety of different scaling options um, for like, different needs, so looking a bit more into what uh, provisioning looks like with Keta, so instead of just creating the LLM service and deployment like one might do in a pretty standard you know Kubernetes environment, instead we also create the HTTP scaled object, which is a custom resource for Keta. So what this does is it kind of configures that deployment, uh, the LLM deployment to either scale up or down based on uh, certain parameters that you can specify in this object. Um, and of course, this is managed by Keta. And this does let us scale, scale down to zero or scale up you know, past one and beyond. So let's first imagine um, that we have an LLM deployment that has been provisioned, but it hasn't received traffic in some time, so Keta has scaled it down to zero. So when a re uh, request would come in, it'll come in through our Istio gateway into the data plane, um, and then it'll get routed to the Keta proxy. So this routing um, is actually kind of dynamic. Uh, we can configure it with Istio virtual services, which we do. Um, and once the proxy receives the request, it will talk to the Keta controller. So the Keta controller will then look at the HTTP scaled object, determine if the deployment is ready to receive request or if you know, there are too many in the queue and it needs to scale up uh, more than one pod. And once it does, uh, you know, determine all this stuff, it will then try to scale up the LLM. So uh, while the scaling is happening, the proxy actually holds on to requests. So then once the LLM is scaled up, uh, the proxy will send the request um, along the normal path. So through the Kubernetes service to the deployment um, and then yeah, onto the pods. So this is kind of how inference happens. So this is pretty cool. It makes it, you know, a fairly serverless experience. You can, you know, uh, 
query an LLM that has been down, that hasn't been used for a while and might have been scaled down, and you'll get a, a response back. But unfortunately, the scaling is quite difficult. So scaling an LLM up from zero, we, we found was very, uh, very bad performance-wise. So it would take anywhere from like 15 to 20 minutes to scale up, which obviously is not a serverless experience at all. You know, the request would time out, you'd have to wait a while. Um, the problem here is that we're not only scaling the pods, but we're also scaling nodes. So pretty much at PartyBase, uh, for LLMs, we only have one pod running on a dedicated node, and the reason for that is essentially the LLM like, needs to use a lot of GPU memory, so it's pretty much gonna use the entire GPU on the node, um, so it doesn't really make sense to run a lot of, of other stuff there. Also, these nodes are very expensive, so the whole point of auto-scaling was to save money. So we don't, we don't want them sitting around uh, for a really long time, because that's incurring costs either on our side or on the customer's side. So this introduces us into the next layer, which is cold start optimizations. So as, um, as mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to scale these LLMs up, and two of the reasons are the containers are large and the LLM model weights are even larger. Um, and of course, we do have to acquire the node into the cluster, but that's kind of like a different set of problems. So the LM containers are quite large because they have to be shipped with things like CUDA and custom kernels to actually serve the LMs. Um, we've done you know, many different things to try to slim down our container images, but they're still you know, in the many gigabytes uh, of size. And the second problem, which is the LMs um, being quite large, uh, for those who are familiar, things like Llama 2, 70 billion, or about 150 gigs on disk. So we have to download all of those weights um, and then load them up into the GPO. So that can take some time as well. So I'm gonna split this up into two different sections. So first will be the kind of container download optimizations. So after a lot of trial and error, uh, we ended up landing on a um, service called Spiegel. Well, an open source project called Spiegel, I should say. Um, so what Spiegel is, is an in-cluster container registry mirror. So what that means is essentially it will you know, mirror a container registry that's uh, external to the cluster but inside of it. And uh, Spiegel, so I'll talk a little bit about how this works, um, but first it runs as like a daemon set on all of the nodes. And what it does is when a pod is started on, the, on a node in Kubernetes, of course the image for the pod will you know, attempt to be downloaded on, onto the node. Um, and this download happens uh, layer by layer, it doesn't just happen all at once. Um, so what Spiegel does is it modifies the container D settings on the node to, instead of going to like the default registry first, it'll actually go to Spiegel uh, when we try to download a layer. And what Spiegel will do is ask all of the other kind of like Spiegel pods in the cluster if any of those nodes that they're living on has uh, the layer that we're looking for. And if the layers are found in the registry, uh, they will be downloaded from the nodes in the cluster rather than going outside uh, to the external registry. So we found this you know, dramatically speeds up uh, the download process. Of course, if a layer is not found, uh, it will have to go out and download from the remote registry. But of course, this layer is now in the cluster. So uh, you know, any, any other pod that needs this layer to start up uh, will be able to download it from inside of the cluster. And another side note is this does require container D um, to be the uh, image or the container runtime in Kubernetes, but we found most of the cloud providers have switched over from Docker, so this hasn't been an issue for us. So overall, um, after adding Spiegel with very minimal configurations, we saw a pretty dramatic increase or decrease in container, container download time. So for our larger GPU images, this went from about eight minutes down to four. So this was quite literally with like very, very few configurations um, and it was pretty plug and play, which is why we ended up using this as opposed to some other, uh, other things we tried. So next, uh, a little bit more LLM specific, we'll talk about uh, weight download optimizations. So before adding anything, um, the weight download process of PrediBase looked like this. Uh, so when the LLM server would start up, we would download the base model uh, if it, if it wasn't from Hugging Face, uh, from Hugging Face Hub, of course, we, we do support a few other uh, sources as well. But once we download the, the weights, um, which could take anywhere from like one to 15 minutes, depending on um, how large the model was, we would have to convert the weights into the safe tensor format if they weren't in that format already. 
So that would take on the order of several minutes. Uh, once you know, they're converted, then we can start up the LLM and uh, start serving traffic. To, uh, to kind of fix this issue, because that was quite a bit of time, um, we added three things. So an init container, a uh, shared storage volume between the init container and the main server, and a private cache in the data plane's uh, blob storage. So first, when the cache is cold, obviously, we're, we're just going to have to do what we did before, so which is just download the weights. Um, but instead, this is taking place in the init container. So the init container will handle uh, converting the, the weights to safe tensor format, um, and then it will push the weights to the cache. Of course, once they're in the cache, we don't have to do this again. So this only happen, needs to happen once per data plane for any specific uh, LLM. And uh, also, the safe tensor uh, weights are mounted to the shared storage volume, so they're access accessible for both the init container and the main uh, serving container. So once the cache is warmed up, uh, we're able, whenever we start an LLM um, in the data plane, we're able to download the weights uh, from this cache. Now, we were actually able to find a pretty fast way to do this, at least in S3, uh, which is using the S3 CRT library. So what this is is a, um, a set of many of the AWS APIs written in C, and it's available in most of the SDKs as well as the CLI. So by enabling this, uh, we're able to do multi-threaded downloads, which is a lot faster. And so for an example, uh, for something like Llama 2 13 billion, which is about you know, 26 to 30 gigs uh, uncompressed, we were, we were able to download the weights in less than a minute, uh, when before it took about like five minutes. And of course, we're able to do this as well because uh, the nodes that these LLMs are running have very fast networking and uh, you know, a lot of CPU, a lot of memory because they're kind of high performance nodes for you know, GPU workloads. Um, and of course, if by chance uh, we do serve multiple LLMs on a single node, uh, these weights are kind of cached onto the node. So we're able to just uh, start up the LLM almost instantly. So here's kind of like a timeline look at what serving uh, was beforehand. So, you know, as you can see, it took quite a bit of time, everything, um, all the way from acquiring the node to converting the weights, you know, we had to do, which took several minutes. But after all these optimizations, we were able to get the container download down to about like four minutes, um, and then the weight download to under a minute uh, for the, uh, the warm cache scenario. And of course, there's no conversion that needs to happen either. Um, so another kind of side note is that you know, a lot of this is now uh, acquiring the node and downloading the container, which can all be erased if you don't auto-scale your nodes. Um, but again, we're coming from um, a perspective of we have uh, you know, deployments in customer clouds and in our cloud as well, and we don't want to keep nodes around for very long because they incur a lot of cost. Finally, uh, we do have one more optimization we've done around LLM serving, which is something uh, Julian kind of alluded to, which is called uh, Lorax. It's more of an application optimization, so I'm gonna go off of Kubernetes a bit right here, but I figured it would be very interesting for everyone here. So when you fine tune a model at Predibase, uh, you can fine tune using a method called LoRa. So for those who are not familiar, um, the LoRa method for fine tuning is you create a very small kind of a subset of weights that you're actually fine tuning instead of all of the weights in the model. And when you uh, use these weights uh, for inference, when you want to do inference on this fine tune model, you load in these LoRa weights and kind of add them to the base model. Um, so actually, you have kind of two distinct things. You have the LoRa weights, which are called the LoRa adapter, and then the base model. So at Predibase, we created a system that kind of lets you, uh, lets you dynamically load in these LoRa weights at inference time. Because they're so small, this does not incur uh, a whole lot of latency. So what you can do is, instead of you know, deploying a whole you know, fine-tuned model every time you want to like, query it, you can just have a base model and then um, specify the adapter you want at query time. So we've seen about you know, 200 milliseconds of latency here uh, for models like waiting. And of course, this can handle concurrent requests as well. So if you have multiple uh, users or multiple models you want to you know, uh, get inference from, uh, you can send the query to the same base model, but with different uh, adapters in each uh, request. And then these adapters are loaded um, 
while, you know, in the model, and they can be loaded while other requests are happening at once. So we can kind of, uh, you know, squish things together and uh, increase the throughput here. Yeah, so that is kind of a very brief, but I'd say pretty thorough look at uh, all the serving happening at Predibase, all the cloud native and uh, a little bit of specialized machine learning uh, optimizations we've done around making serving work. Um, so yeah, thank you. And if you wanna learn more about Lorax, um, I linked a post about it um, here at, in this slide as well. As if you wanna connect with me and Julian, those are LinkedIn's. Um, and there's you know, a few of us here from Predibase, so if you see us around, you know, we love to chat, so you know, uh, we can talk about anything from you know, LLMs, AI stuff, all the way to you know, every, every kind of Kubernetes thing we've done, because we've done a lot more than what was mentioned here. So thank you.